intelligencesquared.com. You've heard from our speakers. It's now the turn of the audience. But before we take questions and comments from you, let me just tell you how you all voted as you were coming into the um, to Cadogan Hall today. So, our motion, the war on terror, was the right response to 9-11. This is how you voted. For the motion, 179. Against the motion, that's your side, 323. <clears throat> don't be too quick, because the don't knows are 200. So, I mean, I'm no mathematical genius, but if you put the don't knows in the four camp, then it could go the other way. So, panel, there's a great deal you can do. Your side, you can try your best. You can try your best to win over those 200s who don't know. And um, I should just tell you that if you want to download a free briefing on these issues being debated today, then you can go to www.intelligencesquared.com and just follow the instructions. Now, um, when you put your question or your comment, please do identify yourselves and wait until an usher brings a microphone to you. Those of you on the balcony, just go to the fixed microphone spots in the center. Now, I'm sure that this is a debate where a lot of you are going to want to intervene. So please, please, please make my life easier by not going on for a long time. And then that means more of you can speak and we can truly have a debate, okay? Is that a deal? That's a deal. All right. Can I see who wants to speak first? And ushers, if you make yourselves available and just go in. And ushers, don't wait until I push you towards somebody. Just push yourselves amongst uh, people who want to speak. So uh, let's go there. Yep. Um, could I inv invite the... Could you say um, who you are, please? Uh, Stephen Gore, a regular attendant at these gatherings. Um, it seems to me that after 9-11, there was an outpouring of goodwill towards the United States. Everybody sympathised. No country supported uh, the, the attacks on the, uh, on the Twin Towers, at least openly. And I want to suggest to you that that outpouring of sympathy was wasted. But what would have been much better in order to get so many of the Arab countries on side for any kind of war on terror, was a resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Without that, no Arab country could possibly have joined in a war on terror because of the bitterness and resentment caused by the plight of the Palestinians. It was possible for a just and fair solution to be arrived at in the aftermath of 9-11, right. and it wasn't taken. Thank you. We'll take that as a comment, and I'll take two or three points at a time before I come back to the panel. I think it may be better for the acoustics if you stand up and make your point, and don't forget to introduce yourselves. So, yeah, if we go there, and we'll take two or three at a time. Mm -hmm. Hi there. Uh, my name is Tim. I'm a member of the public. Um, my question is directed towards uh, Mr Musharraf. Um, sir, um, you talked um, uh, uh, in your speech about the U.S. intervention in Afghanistan just after 9-1-1. Um, may I just ask about um, some reports that were at the time um, that during that war, um, many Pakistani citizens were airlifted out of uh, the Afghan city of Kunduz um, the, apparently these people were maybe working with the Taliban or fighting with the Taliban. I mean, I, I have a quote here from um, uh, respected Pakistani journalist Ahmed Rashid, a, a book of his, he writes, um, certainly hundreds and maybe as, one as, as, as many as 1,000 people escaped. Hundreds of ISI officers, Taliban commanders, and foot soldiers belonging to the IMU and Al-Qaeda Al personnel boarded the planes. So I was just wondering if, if you could say, maybe is that true? And if so, um, why, why were you, uh, your government um, helping these people? All right, OK. Very specific question there to General Sheriff. We'll come to it in a moment. One more, and then, yeah. Um, yeah, Marion Wiley. I'm a care assistant. Um, I was wondering, particularly to Mr. Musharraf, but to all the panellists, what your opinion was on the Obama administration's drone attacks in Pakistan, which have increased quite a lot recently, and whether you condone them, and if so, whether you think they're effective. Okay, one more. 
Yes. Hello, my name is Wajahat Ali, and I'm from Pakistan, and I'm a student here. My question to Dr. Baran, French Minister, he was a uh, French Minister for 2007 until 2010. Your government banned a burqa in French, yeah? Yeah. That act supporting a terrorism, 100%, yeah? While you intervene in the personal behavior of Muslims, yeah? So what you think, is Western not supporting a terrorism by putting that kind of sanctions? So your question is, the French have Who banned the wearing of yeah, the veil. Yeah, wearing a hijab. Yeah. So what? by doing these kind of things, is not that kind of act promoting a terrorism in the East? Right. OK, well, Dr. Kushner, you can make that <laughs> connection. Yeah, answer that point briefly, and then you wanted to answer, put a point about the Palestinian the issue very quickly. Yeah. Yes, very quickly. <clears throat> Extremism <clears throat> must be defeated. To compare extremism in the Middle East, in between Palestinian and Israelis, and in the Middle East, generally speaking, was not right. And at the beginning of bin Laden terrorism, it was not a question of that. But if you want me to say, and we will be all in agreement, that we must set up a real peace, that is to say, to recognize the Palestinian state, etc., yes, we have to, and we try. But honestly, it's very far from the reality of Pakistan, Afghanistan, and the rest. Okay. That is not okay. to say that if we can, please, I will answer, don't be nervous. Yeah, we'll come to that, but just let's finish on the Palestinian yes. issue, because I'd like if to go... We, this is a, an emergency, but it's an emergency in years and years, and we all try to do so and we'll succeed. Okay. But, well, it was not the reason, and it's not an explanation. All right, but Colleen Graffy, um, this was a point that was raised a great deal, and the terrorists in their messages and so on bring up this issue of the Palestinian question. Bush administration didn't really address that well, properly. The, the problem with that argument is that if that were really the case, why didn't Osama bin Laden pause all of the planning for 9-11 when Clinton was on the brink of trying to make a breakthrough with Arafat? That wasn't the point of 9-11. That wasn't what they were gearing through. The, the whole Middle East crisis is a red herring to drive attention away from the dictators and tyrants across the Middle East. Sir Jeremy, do you agree with that? There's no doubt that the United States lost an opportunity to get global sympathy. There's no doubt that Al-Qaeda had very little to do with the Palestinian issue. But that misses the point that the general support out there for doing things that are violent against the West is fed by the stagnation of the Palestinian issue, even if Al-Qaeda did not uh, rely on that for its own influence. The fact that it's still out there uh, getting worse does nothing for our counter-terrorism campaign. And one should, I suppose, recall that after 9-11, the Palestinians themselves... Didn't Yasser Arafat um, really sympathise? Great. He offered to donate blood, didn't he? Yeah. Senator, to can the, I just respond uh, on one thing that was mentioned by both of um, the opposition, and that was this connection between 9-11 and Iraq. There was no connection between 9 and 11 and Iraq, and the Bush administration never made that case. They said specifically... <laughs> okay, read... Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, read anything on what the Bush administration has written, anything, and you will see that they said, what is the connection after 9-11? It's Al-Qaeda and it's Afghanistan. Does it have any connection in Iraq? No, it doesn't. So therefore, do we do both together? No, because it's only about Al-Qaeda and Afghanistan. After that happened, after that, that's when Bush looked around and said, all right, we have a rogue country, as Jeremy Greenstock has said, that has been in violation of 16 UN resolutions under Chapter 7, which means use force if necessary. And the conclusion was, do you let someone who we know has been a threat, not to the America, but to, but to the world, do you let that stand after 9-11? So the administration never made the connection that it was that. It was a separate threat. Since you've brought that up, let's just go to the audience on that specific question of... 
September the 11th and um, no connection between those attacks and Iraq. Who wants to address that point specifically that Colin Graffy has just raised? There, as long as it's just that one in response. No, who, has anybody, does anybody want to say anything could, about that? Could I? You do, yeah. Do, take the microphone and stand please, yeah. I'm Oliver Cam, I'm a leader writer for the Times. Uh, Professor Graffy is simply right. There was no connection between the terrorists of 9-11 and Iraq, but there was a connection between the issue of terrorism and Iraq in this sense. Uh, Dr. Kushner, of whom I'm a great admirer, is mistaken in counterposing the war on terror to a war on poverty and illiteracy, because the terrorists of 9-11 were not poor, and they were not from a poor region. But the variable most closely connected with terrorism is a lack of political openness, whereby dissent migrates to the mosque and radicalism is incubated. Right. That okay. was the connection between Iraq and 9-11. So there was a terror threat from Iraq, but not linked to 9-11. <laughs> Does somebody else want to? Yeah. That specific point. Um, I'm Rabia. I'm doing a, a PhD in South Asian studies. My question is for uh, Professor Graffi. Um, you mentioned the drone attacks um, were successful in stopping training camps, but you failed to mention how many civilian lives have been lost as a result of those drone attacks. Are we meant to just look the other way and pretend like Pakistani lives aren't valuable? Okay, well, we'll link that question to the other one earlier on about the... Why don't we ask you, the drone attacks on Pakistan and your view on that, um, General Musharraf and then Colin Graffi. <laughs> Sure. Yes, indeed. I think uh, I'll try to answer the two questions which are directed towards me. The, I'll take the second one, the drone attacks first. Certainly it goes, it is not in Pakistan's interest. And drone attacks are, as this young lady has said, they are causing collateral damage. Therefore, there is a great public outcry against the drone attacks. And also, may I say, there is a public outcry because it violates the sovereignty of Pakistan. Therefore, from all points of view, Pakistan's national, in, it is against Pakistan's <coughs> national interest to go for no drone attacks, irrespective of the fact that they do target militants. But in the process, they are killing a lot of civilians. Therefore, it is counterproductive. However, we, I do not say that we should not attack the terrorists. Whenever a target is identified, we need to adopt measures to attack that target, those militants, through means which will avoid collateral damage and ensure the sovereignty of Pakistan. This is on drone attacks. The other question was about... Oh, let us call in graph very quickly on the drone attack thing, very briefly. Well, the fact is, is that any loss of life of, is, of course, horrible, but the drone attacks are a technology that allows the most exact and precise targeting that we've ever known in history. And so if you're looking at the various means of military use, the drones are going to have the least effect on the civilian population of anything else. Okay. And briefly, the question, the okay. quote from Ahmed Rashid, yeah, about hundreds yeah. of Pakistanis being lifted yes. from... But Thank on you. drone attacks, again, just to pass a small uh, mm -hmm. remark, Speaking that... Uh, if you start sorry. again, speak closer into the microphone. On the drone attacks, again, although I totally agree that the... Hellfire missiles fired from the drones are very accurate. But however, since these are very congested areas where they are fired, their indiscriminate use does cause a lot of deaths, collateral damage and a lot of deaths in people who are not involved directly. So therefore, as far as Pakistan is concerned, any government in Pakistan cannot be supportive of drone attacks. So On the other issue... Briefly, if you would, yeah. Yes. On the issue, other issue of Pakistanis, a lot of Pakistanis being airlifted from Afghanistan, we have to go back a little into beyond uh, 1996, what was happening. It was 1996 when Taliban came into being. And at that time, there were two warring factions. One was Taliban on one side and Northern Alliance on the other side. Northern Alliance was Uzbek, Tajik, Hazaras, supported by India, Russia, Iran. And the, the Taliban had ethnic links with Pakistan because same Pashtuns on Pakistan side, 
they had all historical cultural links with pakistan and geographic links therefore pakistan had recognized the taliban had missions in had the only country which had a diplomatic mission yeah. in uh, in in kabul therefore we were certainly uh, or we had recognized the taliban and we uh, the government at that time was sympathetic towards the taliban we could not have been on the other side on the northern okay. alliance side so therefore i don't think that they were airlifting of uh, so many people i don't really exactly know whether they were airlifted but they could the presence of pakistanis on the other side uh, was possible okay let's take some more questions from floor. and remember our motion we're getting some very specific questions here which are good but remember what the motion is the war on terror was the right response to 9 11. So please, audience, when you put your points, bear that motion in mind. Up there. Yes, it's Robert Augustinelli, and for full disclosure, I'm familiar and friendly with two of the members of the panel. <laughs> to your point, Madam Moderator, to uh, Mr. Greenstock and Mr. Kushner, Bernard, you, re you recall the point about uh, policing versus the war on terror, directly into this debate. Policing was the policy of most Western governments up to 9-11. It failed miserably. I'd like to hear what you have to say about that. Okay. Oh, well, yeah. Are there pe more people upstairs? Because the lights are in my eyes, so I can't see so well. Yeah. Uh, Left uh, over hand here. side there, yeah. Go ahead, briefly. Go on, yeah. Um, uh, as we've heard repeatedly, Who Krishna's... Who you just introduce yourself? So, so, uh, I'm James Spiller. Uh, I spent most of the last two years working in uh, banking in Baghdad. Um, but uh, I'm not there now. Uh, <laughs> if... if uh, <laughs> Mr. Kushner's claim that there was a grievance of poverty has been rebutted by a couple of people, and the claim of, um, the, that it was about Palestine has been rebutted by a couple of people. But we haven't discussed the actual reason that al-Qaeda gave for attacking, which was the presence of U.S. troops in the Holy Land in Saudi Arabia. And in order to respond to being attacked by that, they could either have left, as they did from Lebanon in 1986, fearing more terror, or they could have stayed, and I, I think it's fairly clear that the Saudi kingdom would have been greatly endangered, or they could leave in victory and not have to protect Saudi from Saddam anymore. Uh, I'm curious what the advocates of law enforcement would claim was the non-violent way of uh, making the troops in uh, Saudi redundant. Well, the Americans did withdraw their uh, base from Saudi Arabia, didn't they? they yeah, announced, because they invaded they announced, Iraq. Yeah, they announced it in 2003. I think it was completed by, what, 2009? Just a handful there now. OK, we'll put that question to the um, panel. Uh, any more upstairs? Yeah, go ahead. One of the reasons given for um, fighting the war on terror was to provide freedom to people, but we've seen fit to um, cooperate with uh, quite brutal dictatorships in places like uh, Libya and Saudi Arabia. Given that Nelson Mandela was originally classified as a, as a terrorist and an extremist, how would we have viewed him in the war on terror, as a friend or an enemy? Right. Uh, any downstairs? Yeah, let's take some. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Karen. I'm from Hong Kong, but I'm living here in England. I wish to ask uh, Pervez Musharraf, do you think Osama bin Laden came back to Pakistan after you were removed, deposed? And prior to when you were still in government in Pakistan, do you think Osama bin Laden was in Yemen, where there is his family come from and there's a very strong Islamic fundamentalist list, Islamist following? Okay, one there and then we'll go to the panel. Mm -hmm. Please keep your answers brief. Uh, my name is Richard Bark. I'm a pupil at Merchant Taylor School. My question actually is to Professor Graffy. You said that military dictators were one of the sort of root causes of terrorism, that they suck the air out of the democratic process, and that in many ways to depose them, you needed direct Western intervention and kind of boots on the ground. I wonder, would you reconsider that statement following the aftermath of the events in Libya, where despite, you know, NATO air cover, the fight has mainly been waged by the Libyan people. There have been no direct Western intervention in terms of troops, and a dictator has been successfully overthrown with a period of relative order, unlike in Iraq, where there were hundreds of thousands of troops, and there, there seemed to be eternal chaos after it, or at All least right. in the first several years. 
OK, very briefly then, first of all, Colleen Graffy. I mean, just yep, would, would Saddam Hussein have gone in the Arab Spring, do you think, with well, all the others? I just want to say thank you very no. much for that question. I think you misunderstood what I said. My point was that Iraq and Afghanistan were the catalyst for these other countries, that with the fall of Saddam Hussein, it allowed these other countries to see a different vision of what the Middle East could be like. And so, therefore, I entirely agree with you. All of these things should be homegrown, and we need to work so hard now on developing civil society, okay rule of law and good Are governance. Are you saying the Arab Spring would not have happened unless Iraq and Afghanistan were invaded? I'm saying that Iraq was the catalyst, as I read from Walid Jamblad. This was something well, that had never opinion. seen so, before. But, I mean, you agreed with I had, There are many yeah. other opinions, but I only had ten minutes. But you're extrapolating minutes. from but what Walid Jamblad said. You Sorry. know where is Walid Jamblad now? <laughs> yes. He's close to Saddam. Close to Bashar al-Assad. Should you say who Ali Jumblat is, of course, is the veteran Druze leader in Lebanon, Lebanon. been there yes, for a, a long time. Yes, veteran Druze leader. He yes. changed several times camps, okay. and now he's a uh, Syrian. So camp. the answer is no. But, okay. Okay. but are you saying? And it's interesting to hear what the panel said. Are you saying then, quite clearly, guy. that without Iraq and Afghanistan being invaded? and Saddam Hussein and the Taliban going, that we would not have seen the Arab Spring and Bin Ali leaving. I, I and said so quite clearly that Iraq and Afghanistan were the catalyst for what we're seeing today. The catalyst. Yes. Do you agree with that, <laughs> President Musharraf? General Musharraf, that question, I mean, if, would you agree with that? On the... On, on the... the, the, the they the were the catalyst, catalyst Iraq Spring. and Afghanistan for the Arab well, Spring. I am... The uh, partner to Colleen, so I would not like to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that's a yes. <laughs> what about you, gentlemen? You, you are putting Sir me Jeremy, in a, in a very Jeremy. difficult situation. Uh, I yes. <laughs> well, we can work out what your answer is on that then. Sir Jeremy. One sentence on the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring was a spontaneous reaction by people empowered by the availability of information, knowing what was going on in the rest of the world against their government stealing freedom and Money. national wealth from them. It is all about that. It was, um... Let Doc, me just say yeah, something go, about... I just finished Dr Kushner on this particular point, the catalyst which took eight years, though, didn't it, from 2003 to... But anyway, mm -hmm. yes. And that's, and uh, the, the, well, the, the catalyst of Iraq Cedar and Afghanistan... The revolution was 2005. Palestinian was before but, that. I mean, it's, it's in steps in progress. It doesn't happen overnight. Look at the Berlin Wall. Bernard Kushner, on this point about Afghanistan, the war on terror and the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan was the catalyst for seeing the Arab Spring and these dictators falling. No, but I, I completely agree with what Jeremy said. This is a fantastic movement, Arab Spring spontaneous in a way that we were waiting for Muslim brothers or extremists, etc., and the people, all the people, what we call the civil society, rejected their dictator. And don't, let's say, mix all the countries. Tunisia was not Egypt, was not Libya, etc., and we don't have but, time but, to but make... But the specific point is, people said, Saddam Hussein has gone from power, and that, in a way, encourages us to also I seek democracy. I don't think so. You don't Look think at so. what's happening now in Iraq. Okay. Look, this is not a, a miracle oh, at you've all. Decided, but you've... what? Saddam Hussein was a dictator. He was a killer. And now there is a, a president of Iraq with a Kurd. This is a good success. The Shiite, the majority of the people, are in power against the minority, the Sunnis. This is another success, but right. it will take time. And for okay. the time being, democracy, a sort of democracy, not okay. the, 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 the British or the Swedish or the French democracy, it, step by step, it will be right. done. Yeah. But it, it has not started anything. No. Okay. Don't so, remember that. You've made that point. Her face, no, Musharraf. No, okay. no, Her face, Musharraf. Yeah. You are talking about Iran. Uh, yeah, but you, I just, about General Iran. Musharraf has decided. General Musharraf has decided to Sorry, comment on General. this specific question. No, then. I, I was trying to answer another point no. of view. This, I, <laughs> I, I don't find it very logical to link Afghanistan or what we did in Afghanistan in response to 9/11 with Iraq. Here was a situation in Afghanistan was that Al-Qaeda, who we equate with terrorism, carried out the 9-11 attack. They are being abetted by the state, by the government of Taliban of Mullah Umar. So this is here is a situation where you have to act against terrorists, 
and a government which is abetting and harboring them. Iraq was a totally different situation. The, it's not linked to terrorism as such. It, it's a different situation. We, we probably thought there is a weapon of mass destruction but and many people around the world. But the war on terror. And you're for the motion that the war on terror was the right response. But, but, no, but so I'm, I'm not. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm so trying to Are you in favour of Iraq? Well, Were you in favour of the Iraq invasion? I'm in favour of the war on terror. And, but and I'm, trying to, I'm trying to deal it. I'm trying to de-link Iraq you, from Afghanistan because I'm not finding the logic of linking the two. But no, and no, how no, are no, the no, two no. linked? We've moved on from that. <laughs> Colleen Graffy made the point. We moved on from that, the fact that you can't link the two, but nevertheless... So we want the vote to be just on threat. Afghanistan. Well, you're not, because you're <laughs> saying that... We want those 200 people to think only Afghanistan. Iraq was also a terror threat, you said, and therefore it was a legitimate target in the war on terror. That's what you said. So just very quickly, General Musharraf, was Iraq part of the war on terror? Should it have been? Well, I, I personally was certainly against the war right. in Iraq, okay. but I am not linking it with attack on terror, really. OK, all right, that made it clear. We had that question, Sir Jeremy Greenstock, on the policing of um, crimes and uh, of terrorism, and the policy had failed. Um, was it saying that terrorism is not a crime or is a crime? Well, it was... Well, that, 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 that question has said policing failed yeah. miserably. That's right. Yeah. And things were missed before 9-11, uh, both internationally and in, in the United States. But I think uh, this panel must make the point that over the last 10 years, and particularly in the last few years, our police, our agencies in the United States, the UK and elsewhere, have done an absolutely fantastic job in protecting us against re repetitions of 7-7 and other terrorist attacks earlier in the decade. They have learnt in homeland security in both US and UK, have learnt to deal with 30 or 40 attacks a year that you never hear about. And they have suppressed them. One event in 10 years in a completely new series of attacks on our societies. Let's give the police and the agencies the real credit that they deserve for protecting uh, our public. Thank you, and, uh, uh, just very quickly, anybody want to? Yeah, um, I have a, a comment about the, um, the bases in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. I just want to remind that why were the U.S. bases in Saudi Arabia? To protect the Kurds in the north and the Shia in the south in Iraq and the no-fly zones. And so there we were trying to assist and this is turned against the United States as being in the land of uh, Saudi Arabia. So right. just a reminder, that's, that's why we were there. And um, the idea that we should be attacked on 9-11 because we're in Saudi Arabia when we're there to protect the people in Iraq is a nonsense. Right. And then the question about how do you define a terrorist? Was Nelson Mandela, when he resorted to violence in the struggle against apartheid, the question was, would you define him as a, as a terrorist? How do you define a terrorist? Sir Jeremy. Terrorism is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, we have tried at the UN countless times to define it, and the UN membership cannot agree on a definition yeah. that excludes state terrorism. Right. There is too much uh, resentful politics in the world today yeah. to come to a definition of terrorism. In, in general, fact, one, yeah. they say one man's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. Sure. So All therefore, right. terrorism really uh, is, has not been defined. And General Musharraf, did Osama bin Laden, who of course was killed by the US Navy SEALs in May in Abbottabad in Pakistan, did he go to Pakistan after you left office? Well, I can't, I can't be sure. I wasn't tracking him, certainly. But uh, he was there in Abbottabad. As far as I'm concerned, whenever anyone asked me where he is, I always said, I don't know. He could be anywhere. He could be in Pakistan or elsewhere. You used to say he's not in Pakistan. He's probably no. more likely on the Pakistan-Afghan border that. inside Afghanistan, didn't you? I, I never said he is not. It's only, I always said I don't know. But when somebody insisted that he's in Pakistan, then I used to say, what is the information? Where did you get this information from? He, he could be anywhere. He could be in Afghanistan or even outside Afghanistan. So that was what Were I Were you used surprised to when he was yes, found indeed. in Abbottabad? Yes, indeed, absolutely. I was shocked that he was in Abbottabad. I mean, living quite openly in a city, just a few miles from an no, no, intelligence. No, not very openly. Yeah. Not very openly. Well, he was it was locked a up big a house, like wasn't it, in an urban area. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't no, a remote no. farm. Sorry? It, 
He wasn't living in a remote farm. It was quite a big townhouse he was living in, quite conspicuous. The best place, the safest place, is in a thickly populated place. This is a town. We call it a garrison. The world knows it as a garrison town, as if it was a walled or perimetered garrison town. This is a tourist resort. It's a hill station. All tourists into the mountains of Pakistan go through Aptabad, a population of 600,000 people. And there are civilians and military people all mixed and stay together. The garrison and the, the, the training centers are open. People visit those training centers. They live in their messes. Okay, and just so, yeah, okay, one very quick question, of course. The Americans wanted to question the widows, the three widows of Osama bin Laden. If you had been president, would you have submitted them, allowed them to do that as a big ally of the U.S. in the war on terror? Certainly. I think they should be questioned. We, we have to, in fact, the onus of giving out to the world, and especially in Pakistan, where there's too much of agitation and, and too much of conspiracy th theories going on, the United States must prove that Osama bin Laden has been killed, number one, and that he was there for five years, number two. Now, this should be done by the United States, because I think over 70% of people in Pakistan think that this is all some kind of a uh, conspiracy theory going on. So I think this needs to be done with, with interrogation of the wives of Osama bin Laden, as well as anyone else, everyone else. But President, at least you better recognize that he was benefiting, I mean, bin Laden of some complicity. This is impossible to believe that uh, he was isolated, uh, close to the barracks and close to the army and etc. So I understand your answer, but honestly, <laughs> yeah, I think I, I certainly my friend I, I certainly would like to react to this. I mean, after all, slippages or poor performance by the intelligence are possible. If you reflect back to 9/11, how is it that 18 people were being trained for months and CIA was asleep, yeah. the most powerful organization? Okay, okay. How was it? How was it? How was it that four aircraft, four airliners are being hijacked from four different airfields and a CIA doesn't know? How is it that three of them go into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, CIA is asleep? So let us allow ISI to have been sleeping Be once at least. Do you want to pick up a point on any of these? Before we go back to the floor, very quickly, Sir Jeremy, would you like to pick up on any of these points that you've heard? I, we haven't answered the question from the gentleman who was worried about uh, Al Qaeda and Saudi Arabia and the U.S. troops in, oh, we in did Saudi the base Arabia. Briefly, but yes, do. Um, the, the point was, of course, that Al Qaeda wanted to change the politics of Saudi Arabia, and the troops of the United States were in the way of that. That was on the route to where they were going. It wasn't relevant to where they came from in their political philosophy in wanting to set up a caliphate in the Middle East. The United States actually were very sensible in withdrawing from Saudi Arabia at that point because the Saudi government couldn't sustain their appeal to their own population with American troops on the right. ground. Okay. So that actually was quite well conceived by the United okay. States. Panel, we're going to go back to the floor, and if we don't have a, point, a chance to answer all the questions, you can incorporate them in your closing statements. Let's go up there, please, quickly. Uh, my name is Khalil Osman. I'm a sixth form student. Um, I've got a question for Colin Graffi who was talking about uh, the origins of terror uh, due to Arab dictators. Do you think that's a fair assumption based on the fact that your government propped up these dictators, uh, Mubarak, billions of dollars, second only to Israel, um, which imposes tyranny on the Palestinians? And let's not forget Saddam Hussein was an American client whilst he was fighting your war against Iran. Okay, all right. Remember the motion, everybody. Okay. As you make your points, admirably short, but remember the motion, yes. Yeah, yeah just go ahead. No, 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 Majid Nawaz, Director of Quilliam. Uh, thank you. Um, I just want to bring it back to the motion. I've got a question for the four panel and a question for the against panel. For the four panel, and please give a direct answer to this. Uh, I don't think, let's separate the name War on Terror from the substance of what actually happened. I don't think we can divorce the symbolisms or the abysmal failures of the decade. Do you support, number one, extraordinary rendition to torture? as part of this war on terror? Do you support, number two, detention without charge, in the case of Guantanamo, for over 10 years? And do you support, number three, uh, invasion and occupation of countries without authorization from the UN? For the against panel. <laughs> the, 
the against panel, uh, I personally, and, and Quilliam, the line we push is we don't see a difference, sorry, we don't see a polarization between, uh, necessarily between military action on the one hand and law and order on the other. There's a middle way. We think there's a third way, and that's to empower civil society. Um, as demonstrated by the Arab Spring. So would you please elaborate on what could have been done to, in that third way to empower civil society rather, rather than take uh, military action? Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's the quickest four questions I've heard in about a minute, ten seconds. Thank you. Uh, yes. It's Keelan Gallagher is my name. It follows on from the last question. It's really a question come comment uh, directed mainly at uh, Colleen Graffy. Uh, during your speech, Ms. Graffy, there were a number of rather grand phrases used concerning the war on terrorism, including the rather flattering label the Freedom Agenda, which uh, goals particularly, given that the war on terrorism, uh, and specifically uh, in the US, the enemy combatant label, has been used on both sides of the Atlantic to justify detention without trial. But there's another phrase which was used, which galled particularly in light of news this week. Uh, you referred in your speech, Ms. Graffy, to the freeing of the human spirit. That's the phrase you used, drawing this continuum between Bush administration policies and the Arab Spring. And then you follow that up with your catalyst okay. yeah. point and answers to questions. Your question. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the question following from that is, you said that we should listen to voices from the region and you spoke about voices from the region, people being empowered to rise up against dictators. But what about a particular voice which has been in the news this week? Uh, the person, the voice of Abdul Hakim Balhaj, Libyan rebel leader, uh, hardly empowered by Bush administration policies. In fact, in the news this week, uh, we read about MI6 and CIA possible collusion in his okay. rendition uh, and torture. Okay. So yeah. far from being empowered by your policies, in fact, he was detained in Thailand in 2004 and then rendered okay. to Tripoli. This is a very long question, and we'll put it in. Uh, it's an extraordinary course. rendition, basically, is what you're saying, as the Quilliam Foundation it, question said. Yes. Would you I, sign up to things like extraordinary rendition? Yes, okay. precisely. Thank you. Thank right. you. Carry on. Briefly, please. Yes? Um, I have a very quick question to General Musharraf. Do you feel that your war on terror has unleashed a version of a war of absolute terror which the people of Pakistan are living every single day today? Because your speech mentioned several things, like a lost po political opportunity of recognizing the Taliban for what it was, of how terrorism in the name of religion is a scourge which should be exterminated. But your party has in the past supported the same political and terror groups. So I wonder whether, in hindsight, you wish you had done things differently. Okay, yeah. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Zia Rahman, and I'm from London. Uh, as all the key speakers, you know, they stated that there are three components of the war on terror, military actions, politically, and social economy. I mean, all, as Jeremy, you stated, you know, I mean, the new policy which has been, you know, in the early this year by Obama administrations, now they are focusing on diplomacy as well as in social economy. Don't you think so? It is the part of the war on terror to make the world safer? Thank you. Okay, up there. Um, hello, my name's Mr. Fan, and I'm a student as well. My question's primarily for Colleen Graffy, but uh, Musharraf, do yep. you have pervades, Musharraf, please feel free to uh, intervene. Um, I was quite persuaded by your argument, and I think only Bush could have done a better job, but I think it's good that he stayed away seeing as intelligence is in the de debate title. However, I was wondering how much strain on the American relationship will the bed and breakfast that the Pakistani government was providing for Osama bin Laden do you think will make your job harder in Afghanistan and, Afpa and Pakistan? And if you feel that your task is essentially made impossible, if your closest and most strategic ally can't be trusted, essentially. Okay. Some more points and questions, yep. If you keep them short, I can go to all of you. Yep, go ahead. Uh, James Lockland, uh, with apologies to Colleen Graffy, I'm afraid I have a question for her as well. Um, she uh, defined the war on terror as being more than just a shorthand and said it had particular targets, namely Al-Qaeda Al and the governments that supported it. She explained how calling it a war was necessary 
uh, by comparison with the war on drugs, saying that you needed a whole range of uh, responses available. Now, in contrast to the war on drugs, we know that in the war on terror, there is uh, prolonged detention and uh, okay. sophisticated interrogation techniques. I don't want to debate the merits of that, but my question is, does the war on terror have particular objectives? Because it's only if we know what the particular objectives are can we then judge whether they have been achieved and when they've achieved and say those kind of perhaps legitimate means of extended detention, interrogation, uh, ought to be brought to an end. So what are the objectives of the war on terror? Thank you. Yes. Um, carry on. Who's got the microphone? Just speak. Stand. Hello. Yeah. Oh. Hi, my name is David. Um, the four speakers discussed the, the, the military aspects of these war on terror, but as we've just seen from the last questions, that there's real social aspects to the war on terror, particularly in the West, of our way of lives, of how we suspect others on the tube. Do, you th do we th really think that that's a just response to the war on terror, the fact that we suspect everyone who's sitting next to us on the tube that he might blow himself up next. Our way of life has changed completely in the last 10 years. Is it, surely the terrorists have won, the fact that we've changed? Up there? Yep, Georgiana Vaughan, I have a question about the viability of alternatives. So Jeremy just mentioned that the UN can't agree on a definition of terrorism. I've worked for the UN, and if they can agree on the colour of your shirt, it's a bloody miracle. In today's society, is the UN really a viable institution through which we can channel the war against terror? Bravo! Um, I'm Angela Weaver from the US, and my question for all of you is, um, if the war had started at a later time with a finer focus, do you think the opinion of the world on the war would change? And if that's true, do you think that the war would be able to still remain as focused as it was? Yeah, up there, and then we'll go down quickly. Hi, yes. Mark Riley. Just a quick question on the 200 undecided that walked in the room, who I think uh, I represent. I've heard four excellent speeches tonight, and I've swayed both ways twice, four times. And I think as someone was asked about the uh, equivalence of the of the French Revolution, I think it's still too early to tell. Okay. Yep, who's got the microphone down here? Yep, go ahead. Hello, my name is Dominic Howell. I'm a teacher at Merchant Taylor School. Um, and I promise I do have a very short question, but, but uh, since this is going out on the BBC, a quick comment to Zainab Badawi. You started off the debate by uh, pointing out that Dr. <laughs> Uh, that, that the doctor um, uh, had uh, overstayed his welcome on the stage. Uh, I'd like to point out uh, President Musharraf did that as well this evening. Uh, and Actually, he did it by two minutes longer. Well, so. and, and also, of course, when he was in Pakistan. Um, no, Dr Kushner was. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> carry on, carry on. I, I also note that uh, both the speakers on the four side uh, represented administrations that didn't come to power through elections, at least not... Uh, not, 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 not in the conventional sense. Even if you don't accept the first, the second but, is overwhelming. Come on. But uh, I have a very short question for President Musharraf. Uh, when he was in power and his successors uh, were the victims of the war on terror, okay. yeah. uh, they criticized it as being counterproductive and as bringing more people uh, onto the side of Al-Qaeda than it removed from the battlefield. Okay. So I, I would like to very ask him, long. why it's is he long. on that side? All right, okay. A couple of final points, and then, panel, you'll have to incorporate these questions. Yep. Yeah. My name is Muhammad questions. Ali, and I'm from uh, Pakistan. Um, my question is quite long. I'm, I'm oh, really no, no, sorry. Oh, no, 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 so, no. We can't, we can't. Please. I'll, I'll, we short, can't. I'll, try to, I'll try my Read level best. Read the last three lines. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, but, uh, you know, I start, to, I start from a uh, French minister. Um, oh, no, no, no. As, really, it's too you long. Know, Pakistan was segregated. Pakistan was segregated in the uh, 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 1990s after the Cold War. And sorry, the sanctions were put down up to... Now. Sorry? I'm sorry. Uh, really, just 20 seconds. Yeah, I'm trying my level. Please, yeah. please. Yeah, we were segregated, no. and the sanctions were put down up to our eyeballs. And then after that, 9-11 happened. Uh, Mr. Musharraf... Holy solely, with open heartedly, he came along onto the international scenario and started helping the United Nations. I'm okay. coming down to the question. Then, uh, no, I, I haven't got time. I'm so sorry <laughs> because we're running out of time, and we're going to go to the closing statements. Have you got a final sentence? Please? I am. I am coming to it. Yeah. What, 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 what I'm trying to say is really that Pakistan has lost 65,000 civilians. Yeah. Pakistan has lost more than. 
uh, 7,500 army personnel as well as police officers. Okay. And then even after that, we are still uh, uh, hearing the rhetoric of uh, do more and do more okay. and do. Thank I, I Thank think- Thank you for that point. Thank you for yeah, that point. Thank you. It's been made. Yeah, okay. I think we haven't got time now to go to any more questions. I'm so sorry.